Hello and welcome. My name is Campbell and this is Autodidactic Channel where we look into the story that we've been given by the mainstream and see if it actually adds up with what we see in the outside world. And today I wanted to hit a topic and it's starting to be talked about more and more. And that is the shape of the realm that we find ourselves in. And more specifically, how big is it? Is there more land? Because the more we look into the past, when we look at maps, when we read the old stories, uh, there is a definite line of narrative that seems to point to the fact that there is more land to the north and to the south. And so that's what I wanted to get into today. So let's jump into it. So this is a book called Worlds Beyond the Poles by F. Amadio Giannini. And this was sent to me by the guys at Truth Through Revelation. And uh, basically, yeah, this is a book uh, about F. Amadio Giannini and his theory that there may indeed be a lot more land outside the poles and that what we're looking at isn't exactly what we think it is when we look up into the sky. And it starts, 1959, Physical Continuity of the Universe. The enclosed pages contain the first and only description of the realistic universe of land, water, oxygen and vegetation where human and other forms of animal life are bound. This is not a work of fiction, nor is it a technical analysis of anything. It is a simple recital of fact which transcends the most elaborate fiction ever conceived. It projects man's first understanding of the factual and endless universe which contains human life throughout its vast length and width, regardless of all abstract theory to the contrary. It is diametrically opposed to the assumptions and the mathematical conclusions of theorists and technicians throughout the ages. It is truth. These pages describe the physical land routes from the earth to every land area of the universe about us, which is all land. Such routes extend from beyond the North Pole and South Pole. So-called ends of the earth are decreed by theory. It will hereby be adequately shown that there are no northern or southern limits to the earth. It will thereby be shown where movement straight ahead from the pole points and on the same level as the earth permits of movement into celestial land areas appearing up or out from the earth. An original treatise Basic to this book was written and has been expounded at the American Universities 1927 to 1930. Since then, the U.S. Naval Research Bureau and the U.S. Navy's exploratory forces have conclusively confirmed the work's principal features. Since December 12, 1928, U.S. Navy polar expeditions have determined the existence of indeterminable land extent beyond both pole points out of bound of the assumed isolated globe. Earth as postulated by the Copernican theory of 1543. On January 13th, 1956, as this book was being prepared, a US naval air unit penetrated to the extent of 2,300 miles beyond the assumed South Pole end of the Earth. That flight was always over land and water and ice. For very substantial reasons, the memorable flight received negligible press notice. The United States and more than 30 other nations prepared unprecedented polar expeditions for 1957-58 to 
to penetrate land now proved to extend without limit beyond both pole points. My original disclosures of then unknown land beyond the poles in 1926 to 1928 was captioned by the press as more daring than anything Jules Verne's ever conceived. Today, 30 years later, the United States, Russia, Argentina and other nations have bases on that realistic land extent, which is beyond the earth. It is not space as theory dictated. It is land and water of the same order that comprise known earth territory. This work provides the first account of why it is unnecessary to attempt shooting up or out from the terrestrial level for journey to any of the astronomically named celestial land areas. It relates why such attempts would be futile. These pages present incontrovertible evidence that the same atmospheric density of this Earth prevails throughout the entire universe. Such a feature proved that, except for the presence of its gaseous sky envelope and underlying oxygen content equivalent to that of the Earth, we could never observe the luminous celestial areas designated as star or planet. It is shown here that in a determination of realistic cosmic values that the observed luminous areas of the universe about us represent celestial sky areas, and that they are as continuous and connected as all areas of this Earth's continuous and connected sky. Hence, it is shown that there are no globular or isolated bodies to be found throughout the whole universe. They are elements of lens deception. Accordingly, the absence of celestial bodies precludes any possibility of bodies circling or ellipsing in space. This work is radically and rightfully opposed to astronomical conclusions of all ages. It depicts the illusions developing from the telescopic observations and photographs of the universe about us. It clearly explains and vividly illustrates why those lens-developed illustrations have been mistakenly accepted as facts. The book is therefore unparalleled in the long history of man's attempted interpretation and recording of the universe about us. It projects man's first understanding of the fractal and endless universe which contains human life throughout its vast length and width regardless of all abstract theory to the contrary. Extrasensory Perception, a one-minute express to the universe about us. This is reality. It is truth stranger than any fiction the world has known. There is no physical end to the Earth's northern and southern extent. The Earth merges with land areas of the universe about us that exist straight ahead beyond the North Pole and the South Pole points of theory. It is now established that we may at once journey into the celestial land areas by customary movement on the horizontal from beyond the pole points. It is also known that the flight course from this Earth to connecting land area of the universe about us, which appears up or out from the Earth, will always be over land and water and vegetation common to this Earth area of the universe whole. Never need we shoot up as polar misconception demands to reach celestial land existing under every luminous area we might observe at night. On the contrary, we will move straight ahead and on the same physical level from either of the theory's imaginary pole points. Confirmation of such a flight course is had in that of the S Navy Task Force of February 1947, which penetrated 1,700 miles beyond the North Pole point and beyond the known Earth. Additional and more recent confirmation was acquired by the flight of a U.S. Navy air unit on January 13, 1956, which penetrated 2,300 miles over land beyond the South Pole. There is no space whatever between areas of the created universe, but there must deceptively appear to be space in all observations. 
at the parent space results from the illusory globularity and isolation of celestial sky areas. The same illusory conditions have been proved to develop from observation of luminous outer sky areas of the terrestrial outer sky, means the sky as it is observed against the stratosphere darkness. The same illusory conditions have been proved to develop from observation of luminous outer sky areas of the terrestrial. Outer sky means the sky as it is observed against stratosphere darkness. The concept that the universe is comprised of globular and isolated bodies originated from the curvature that is developed by all lenses and that lens-developed curvature fosters the deceptive appearance of globular and isolated bodies comprising the universe. The bodies are illusory. The ancient conclusions of Galileo Galilei that luminous celestial areas are isolated from each other and are circling or ellipsing in space was founded on the inescapable errors of lens functioning. The circling movement, apparent to Galileo, is an illusion. In an endless land and sky universe of reality, the undulating or billowing of luminous sky gas enveloping the entire universe must deceptively appear as a circling or ellipsing movement. The deceptive appearance develops from the fact that such gaseous sky movement is detected by a circular lens, Hence, there is necessarily reproduced the circular and therefore globular appearing lens image. Under the mobile sky gas which extends throughout the celestial realm, there is undetectable but very factual land, water, vegetation and life like that that is common to this earth. Therefore, the so-called stars and planets of astronomical designation are in reality lens produced apparently globular and isolated areas of a continuous and unbroken luminous celestial outer sky surface. It envelops every land area of the celestial in the same manner that it envelops the terrestrial land. One may question how such features were known when science was without record of them. If so, one has but to finish reading this chapter which adequately describes how, when, and where. It was October 1926 when he who sought the answers to the universal mysteries wandered through a woodland vale of old New England, lavish with the scented breath of pine and birch and hemlock. So as you can see, uh, what he's saying here is that when we look up from the earth, he is saying it's a flat earth and it has no edges. And when we look up, because we're looking through a lens that is convex, uh, so shaped like a dome, basically what that does is it brings the, the land around us from the edges up and, and makes it appear that it's curving up over our heads. And so he is saying that, that this is the whole problem, is that every time we look at space, we're looking through curved glass. So we're looking through curvature. And so, of course, we then see that curvature. Uh, but the curvature is only in the glass. It's not actually there in reality. And, uh, of course, we all know about Admiral Byrd and the Smoky God story and many others that talk about land beyond the North Pole and we also have all the uh, stories of the Arctic, uh, Admiral Byrd again, uh, the Nazi Party. And on top of that, we have the Arctic and Antarctic Treaties. So we are not allowed to go there, guys. We can't go anywhere near there. It is completely blocked off to us uh, by military and only open to people who are given permission. So... What is really out there? Because as we get down the road of 2020, we're finding out that more and more of this reality is just an imposed story uh, put there to, to control us, but also to keep us in a box and to hide the information and the real truth of where we are from us so that they can control us. 
And it says here, the old, the traditional and established is always the sacred cow feeding on the clover of assumption in each time's pasture of cultivated and acceptable conceptional values. Therefore, it must be preserved at any cost. The new and unknown is always fearful to the majority. The fears attending normal pursuits within the established social pattern may be dispelled or at least modified by one means or another. But the fear of that which is new and unknown and which is beyond the conditions and afflictions of the ordered pattern must disturb the conforming majority. Routine is the order of pattern, and though it is at times fatiguing, it embraces a measure of security, symbolic of safety. Hence, the new and the unknown must be in some measure resented, and must always fight for a hearing. Human nature demands that beliefs acquired must be cherished and protected, be they ever so incomplete and faulty. My truth is the truth, so say we all. Thus, like the porcupine projecting its quill in sensing possible danger, the majority become automized to throw against the new and unknown the oral quills of skepticism, cynicism and ridicule, without even hearing values inherent in the new. They fear that the new might encroach upon or upset cherished beliefs. And isn't that so true? So, uh, you know, this is obviously written back in uh, oh, sort of the 30s, 40s, I believe, but it's, yeah, uh, quite quite a few big words in there. But, I mean, I'm sure you understand that he's basically saying, yeah, that when you try and tell people new information, they resist it. You know, people love uh, to, to stay in their box, don't they? They love to have beliefs and to then fight for those beliefs. And, uh, you know, it has to do with, you know, you, your subconscious mind will always make you right. It will always make you believe you're right, pretty much. Uh, this is the law of attraction, right? Whatever you believe is what you get. Uh, but the problem with that is, if you believe all your, you know, viewpoints and information are correct, then you'll never get any more information. And so if you're wrong, you're going to stay wrong. And, yeah, this is the problem we have. You know, the majority fight against new information and so being autodidactic obviously means to take in as many different points of view as we can and looking into this you know it does relate to many other uh, like I said before texts maps you know theories theosophies etc that point to the fact that there is a lot more going on there's more land and there are different uh, beings and creatures that aren't that far from us. And it looks like we may have been walled in somehow. But as we can see this year, things are changing quickly. So is this what's going on? Are we, you know, are the poles melting? Are we suddenly going to get access? And are the outer lands going to get access in? You know, are we trapped in with the baddies here and are there goodies? I'm hoping there's goodies on the outside. Uh, you know, is this what's going on here? Because the whole global warming thing, right? And the whole melting ice that they've been yelling about for decades. You know, what is that? They see it as bad, but is it something good? Is it actually our, our you know, the gates to our freedom opening? And this is obviously, you know, a long book. I'm not going to read it all. I will leave the link in the description, but I'll go through a few more uh, bits and just try and... Uh, yeah, pull this theory together so you understand what he's saying. So it was then discovered that the observable luminosity of all celestial areas results from the fact that every celestial area possesses the same sky known to envelop the terrestrial, is luminous when observed against the dark stratosphere by inhabitants of the celestial land territory. Hence, it is the existence of a blue sky enveloping all celestial areas which permits the terrestrial inhabitants to observe that celestial blue sky's gaseous luminosity against the stratosphere darkness. In 1927, science, without knowledge that any terrestrial sky area would be luminous when observed from beyond the sky, there had been no stratosphere observation of photography 
which could have shown the appearance of any terrestrial outer sky area. The first observation of photograph was achieved by the stratosphere explorer, Professor August Picard, in May 1931. In only a it only approximated a view and photograph of a terrestrial sky area from the stratosphere darkness because Picard had not achieved sufficient altitude for a completely dark stratosphere background which would properly express outer sky luminosity. Okay, so again, it, it is written, uh, you know, yeah, it's a bit technical and it's sort of uh, older English, I guess. Okay, so what he's saying here, uh, if I've got this correct, is that there's no proof when we look around there's no proof that the atmosphere around us ends so when we look up obviously at night time we see blackness at daytime we see you know blueness but when we look sideways you know we just see the land like there's no end if we're on a ball shouldn't we be looking out to blackness and blueness but what we see is a non-ending sort of atmosphere and, and we still see this at the poles, that there's no curvature down of the atmosphere ending, you know, no matter how far you go. It's only when you look up through a lens that you get that curvature. And there was a photo, and it is uh, in this book. It's actually really, uh, here it is, it's really grainy and really bad. But this was taken, uh, when did he say, I think the 40s, from a rocket up in space. And this is supposed to be, I think, the edge of the Earth. So this is the line of land, I think, or just, you know, this is the, um, not the edge, but the, you know, the, the flatness, the horizon of the Earth. And as you can see, there's this bit here. And he was saying that this sky, as you can see, this whole area, tend, it looks like it keeps going, because if you look at these, these are just look like leading lines that continue out and so this area that's down here where there should be land is the same as what's up here so he's the theory is that all of this is actually flat and out in front if you can imagine so it's actually straight ahead of you but when you look at it through a lens it pulls it back up on a curve uh, so like again like I said it's a really bad photo uh, it says 65 miles up, uh, six, uh, V2 rocket, 65 miles up. Yeah, it doesn't say what year. Um, shows the globular illusion and photographic distortions as expressed by Giannani. So, yeah, I think I got that right. A journey over the Earth's skylight road of illusions. The lens is the culprit and the deception is the crime. Okay, so here we have a bit of a better picture. So as you can see, this says up here is the stratosphere. Uh, the photographing point of that picture we just saw was 65 miles up. Uh, this is photographing point 14 miles up, and this is 10 miles up. Apprehending the lens in the act of deception in stratosphere photography. Stratosphere photographs prove how the lens develops curves which are seen as discs. They are purely illusory and they impose the globe body delusion. This triple illustration expresses the historical sequence of events confirming the camera lens development of the deceptive curve. They conform the physical continuity of the universe. On the left is depicted the beginning of the curve development by the camera lens utilized in Augustus Picard's stratosphere ascent of May 1931. That achieved an altitude of 10 miles, where Picard had barely penetrated through our familiar blue sky. There is shown the beginning of lens-produced curvature of that particular sky area. It appeared as an illuminated upturned disc. 
that's uh, so that's we'll have a look at the picture in a minute. Uh, the center disk like development shows the deceptive appearance of the sky area penetrated by Albert W. Stevens of the U.S. Army Air Corps at the altitude of 14 miles. So this is the 14 miles, this is the 65, and illustration one, what have we got down here? Okay, so, oh, okay, so down here, okay, so I thought that was the land surface. This is the land surface. This is how far they've gone up. And when they've taken the photos, uh, we have flat down here and we have this uh, globular or globe type shape appearing, which is he is saying is produced by the curvature in the lens. So everything's flat until you get a certain point up. And then when you look out, it seems to uh, be a globe. And I mean, we see this a lot as well, uh, you know, accentuated with shots that we get from GoPros, which are fisheye lenses. So he's, you know, a fisheye lens is just a lens that's been designed for more curvature. And he's saying, you know, which makes sense that any curved lens will give you an image that has curvature in it. And so, yeah, everything's uh, flat here, 10 miles up. He's getting a little bit of globe, you know, glob, uh, curvature, shall we say, curvature in the photo. And as you get higher, it gets bigger and bigger. So it says here, Black Hills of South Dakota, 1935, the greater altitude permitted development of full curvature which is detected as a disc. It represents completion of lens function, which develops the partial upturned disc into a full disc. And so that's what he's talking about here. The higher up you get, you get more of the disc. So I suppose if you're up here, you would get, you know, an actual, uh, you know, like a, a full circle that we would call a star or a planet. Okay, so this is a, another picture the arrows indicate the stratospheric journey from new york city to chicago only luminous disc-like sky seen from dark stratosphere and all celestial areas so this is the sky it says only earth's blue sky seven to ten miles seen from earth land only earth seven to ten miles okay what's he saying here chicago detroit michigan Thousand mile stratosphere journey over the Earth's skylight road of illusions. Thousand mile stratosphere journey from New York City to the luminous and illusion producing outer sky. Because of the lens curve, deceptively appears as numerous, rounded, and uh, I haven't got all of the words here, and therefore thoroughly isolated bodies identical to astronomy's fictional uh, I'm not sure <laughs> I'm, I'm losing off the words here fictional theory of stars and planets through the inner blue sky and the sky are both above to complete the illustration it must be remembered that the earth's blue sky is seen only through our earth's atmosphere whereas the earth's blue sky is seen from stratosphere darkness during day and night and from all other land areas of the universe during night's darkness the illustration was originally presented to the science of editors of this nation's press services prior to the procurement of any stratosphere photographs of our earth's luminous disc-like appearing sky segments the u.s naval research bureau's v2 rocket camera photographs since October 1946, conclusively confirm the presentation. And here it is, a uh, picture up here. So uh, it's saying the stratosphere is moving this way. This is ground level, and this is the sky. Uh, from 7 to 10 miles, seen from Earth land. So he's saying we're getting these half disks here, but above it is flat. So this must be, I suppose, to observe ten, 7 to 10 miles, you would need a telescope or a lens, and that's producing these funny curves. So I'm not sure. I think that's just uh, 
it's not like a photo. This is just a drawing, I think, or a representation that this is what you would see from different areas. So if you're in Chicago, you would see this. If you're in Detroit, you would see this. So clearly these are not big enough to be one, you know, big arc. You know, the arcs aren't big enough when you're on Earth looking up to actually be, you know, the arc of the whole all Earth, if that makes sense. It is pertinent to explain that the identical spectrum variations of celestial analysis will be found to apply to luminous outer surface sky areas of the Earth. The same misinterpretation of values will ensue, and with realization of their terrestrial sky areas, factual values, the misinterpretation of celestial values should become manifest. Astronomy holds a unique, most unenviable position. It is unlike any fruitful science known to man. Its premise is eternal, though it be the most illusory ever established. Philosophy, seeking to find behind things and events their laws and eternal relations, dares to abandon a premise found to be at variance with fact. Only in such manner can philosophy continue to seek for, determine and interpret values in the world of reality. Though philosophy's broad horizons extend the things and conditions of the physical world into the metaphysical realm, there is ever a continuity of pattern wherein things and conditions for a physical plane continue to be reasonably identified on the metaphysical plane. But despite its broad scope, philosophy need not resort to figurative definitions of its transcendent values. Obscuring equations and symbols are not required for coherent description of factual values, interpretable by words. Where there is a fact to convey, words will be found to express it, but where there are no facts, mathematical symbols very formidably obscure the condition. Astronomy claiming to interpret the physical universe possesses knowledge of neither the beginning nor the end of its telescopic domain nor has that domain origin or ending in a world of reality. Sky gases misinterpreted as land masses can hardly be considered expressive of reality, nor can the gross misinterpretation of energy's wave motion to be prescribing a circular or ellipsing motion assist man's comprehension of the created and realistic universe and afford closer attunement with the infinite. <laughs> so again, yeah, the, the language in this is, you know, it's, it's, it's not that bad, but it's uh, definitely not current. It's definitely not modern uh, English, is it? But basically, you know, I mean, he's just explaining what we know. He's explaining that, that with, you know, uh, sciences, you know, <laughs> like astronomy, when they can't explain things, uh, they just make up big, you know, equations and big long words and, make things uh, seem very difficult. And it's so that they can say, well, you know, we know all this stuff. We, you know, here are the smart people. You should listen to us because we're the experts. And so then they obfuscate. They make all their information, uh, you know, too hard for us to interpret. And most of the time, they don't interpret it either. It's just written down that way. And so, yeah, they basically invent things to try and prove their theory and we know this in science they invent things like dark matter to prove theories they invent things like gravity to prove theories because no scientist can explain to you what dark matter is or what gravity is they're both just invented to put into theories to make the theories work in their minds and so that's what he's saying here the exact same is happening with astronomy you know they've seen these things and they've you know said, oh, it's the stars and it's, you know, it's planets and it's infinite and all this stuff. But really their problem is in the telescope they're looking through. You know, the, the problem is, you know, a few inches from their eyes. It's nowhere, it's not out in space. And this is, you know, and <laughs> it's almost a saying, isn't it? It's the lens that they're viewing the world through that is wrong. Yeah, I mean that, yeah, there you go. The heavens proclaim the glory of God and they would proclaim that glory if a telescope had never been invented. After centuries of telescopic astronomy, man beholds the same luminous splendor displayed for its earliest ancestors. 
He sees no more and he knows no, no more of the celestial heavens above. Though telescopes have found more points of light for the telescopic lens, they continue to be incompetent to penetrate such light points and to permit determination of realistic value attaching to the lights and what is under the lights. Further, the abstract mathematical values imposed on lights detected have so distorted real created values that they have become, that they have become progressively more obscure with each advancing year of the telescopic detection and astronomical interpretation. In fact, the abstract mathematicians have so mathematized the real universe that it has been made a figurative universe where only mathematical symbols may dwell. And isn't that true? You know, it's all, it's all maths, isn't it? It's all equations and stuff trying to explain, you know, the, the wonder that we see when we look up in the sky. And again, like he said, we see the, si the same sky that our ancestors saw you know, hundreds and thousands of years ago. Nothing's changed. We we have no more information of what these places are. We have no real information. We have, you know, pictures that we know are fake and all these stories and all these, you know, it's always projections, isn't it? We're going to do this, we're going to do this. But we never really get much bang for our buck when it comes to, you know, NASA and space exploration. You know, apparently they went to the moon, but what happened there? What did we get from it? nothing uh, just a lot of wasted money so so this is the thing you know we're sort of 70 years into this right they, they went up to the moon in the 60s uh, so 50 years maybe 50 and a bit um and yeah what have we got what do we know that what do we know more about the sky and the heavens nothing nothing at all just more more silliness and more unexplained theories that have to keep being lengthened and made more com complex uh, just really to, to pull wool over people's eyes so that when you look at it, it's like, oh, too hard basket, I won't get into that. Leave it to the experts because they obviously know what's going on. And they do. They're lying to us. Uh, so, yeah, so this guy, th this um, theory seems to make quite a bit of sense in what he's saying. You know, if you look through a curved lens, surely you're going to see a curved picture. The land extending beyond both terrestrial imaginary poles is a minute area of worlds beyond the poles. It is an area of the worlds envisioned by the prophet Moses 3,300 years ago. It is a land area room of the many mansions of Christ's disclosures 1,930 years ago. Just beyond the northern and southern polar fringes of the terrestrial Continue the celestial land and waters leading throughout the universe whole. From such polar points we may at once and at will continue journey without shooting up to the valley of the moon, and to Mars, and Jupiter, and to any other area of the universe whole. The so-called heavens above are to be observed at every angle out of the terrestrial. Begin where the northern and southern terrestrial polar ice diminishes. A seven-hour flight into the land areas of the heavens above was accomplished in the memorable naval exploit of February 1947. That performance beyond the North Pole point of theory was so simple that adequate explanation would have rendered it most confusing, and it is evident that no one was capable of explaining in the 1947 Naval Task Force flight, there was land and water and vegetation under the airplane course as progress was made from the North Pole point. If the Naval Force had possessed motive supplies enabling them to continue and the equipment to provide essential bases along the route, they could have then penetrated into the Celestial for a 100,000 miles or more instead of only 1,700. In 1956, naval penetration of the land beyond the South Pole extended 2,300 miles over land area and the so-called heavens above. Recent and planned international polar expeditions can extend as far into the universe about us as their resources will permit. There is no end to the extent of the possible penetration. 
the unlimited natural wealth of celestial areas extending from the terrestrial pole points has already developed a spins and bitter competition between the nations and it should stimulate all possible corporate exploitation. After centuries of empty conjecture, knowledge is at hand that the land routes to the untold wealth of the deceivingly patterned universe extend beyond the ice-blocked passages of the North Pole and the South Pole. Continued penetration of such areas will develop discovery and presently unknown human life and other animal forms. Yesteryear's dread of the fearful unknown may be dispelled in the light of the unprecedented modern research and discovery, for they confirm that there is no northern or southern end to the earth. The terrestrial world is in fact a world without end. It is so, or I could not have told you. Light of Illusion Light that seemingly so far you are not a detached star, and no mystery can be of your shining quality, of your shining quality. Though you twinkle seems to be, it's a trick I play on me, for I've learned how they deceive, and illusory image leave, as patch of outer celestial sky you're bewitching to the eye, yet you cover unseen land and does earthly sky at hand. You know not isolation's plight through the presenting lonely sight, for your LinkedIn sky embrace common to this earthly place. And there we go. <laughs> so this is again, the book is Worlds Beyond the Poles. And uh, what was the guy's name again? But I mean, this uh, links in with obviously with many other things that we've been looking into and discussing. Uh, there it is, F. Amadio Giannani. Again, I'll leave the link to this uh, book below in the description so you can have a read of it yourself. And as he rightly points out, we have, uh, you know, we know Admiral Bird's flown over the poles, gone probably a lot further than we've been told. And this has been going on since... Uh, well, he was stayed in the 20s, but definitely since the 40s. And so we're talking uh, about 80 years, guys, 80 years that they could have been going out there. And of course, we have things, you know, like the, the shuttle, you know, uh, and this is this has been questioned a lot. The shuttle doesn't go straight up. It goes in a big curve. And this, you know, again, uh, it's been thrown up uh, with the crater Earth theory and uh, you know, are these shuttles actually going out to the to the bigger Earth rather than landing in the ocean? Are they are they just because clearly they're not going to space? So is that why we see these big arcs on the shuttles uh, that when they're taking off that they're actually going sideways because that's where the moon is, that's where Mars is, right? It's the land out, you know, further out from the poles from us. That's what seems to be. Uh, the case because again there's so many old maps as well that show more land in the middle more land at the end but they also show when you look at these lands different animals and different beings giants pygmies uh, beings with really big ears beings with faces in their chests and no heads um, you know dragons griffins all this stuff and is this where a lot of you know our mythology comes from you know, are dragons and griffins and, you know, phoenixes and all this kind of stuff, pegasus, unicorns, are they just all animals, you know, that are normal to realms outside of the one that we know? And, and all these different beings, you know, aliens, of course, aliens, right? Where are aliens coming from? Uh, they probably are coming from what we think or what we call a different planet. So they're just coming from extra land that's outside and they have the technology to fly in and no doubt uh, you know the controllers the parasites here have the technology and the ability to fly out as well or at least to get out to the outer lands is that where they're all fleeing to now is that where they're running to are they scared of someone you know another race coming in a benevolent race that, that's here to help and is this ice wall 
was that somehow caused? Was that, you know, was that made by the parasites? Is, is it not natural? Is it something that maybe occurred as a result of, you know, the catastrophe, the bombings that we see and the mud flood and all this kind of stuff, plasma events? Uh, was it some kind of, was it attached to that so that basically after this, after they destroyed the old civilization, they then walled us in and no one could get in or out? And they just took over and took control. And at the same time as locking us in, they blocked out other people or other races, other beings that may or may not want to have helped to help us. Are they trading with these people now? Is this where all the tech's coming from? You know, there's so many questions. So there you go. I'm going to leave it there. Like I said, the link's in the description. Uh, please leave me a comment. Let me know what you think about this. Uh, you know, about the... The theory, you know, lens, lens deception, curved lenses give us a curved image of reality. Is that what's going on here? And is this a plan? Did they know about this? And they're just using, you know, the lens as a way to get their uh, misinformation across, you know, that we're stuck here by ourselves on a, on a ball floating through space, you know, nowhere near any other uh, civilizations. Or is it just something that's happened and they've just been reading the information wrong? What do you think? Because again, this all happens around, what, the 1500s? All the maps change. Telescopes come out. Globes come out. You know, it's a big thing. So, yeah, the globe deception, the lens deception. It looks like there is a lot more land. It's all flat. And we're just, again, being lied to. Uh, about where we are and more importantly about what is around us and guys if we're talking you know <laughs> this is real and there's lots of land out there lots of civilizations uh, that could be awesome all right so thanks for spending some time with me like i said leave me a comment uh, and a like please hit the bell um, and then you'll be notified of future uploads and share this content if you find it interesting and thanks for spending some time with me. Have an awesome day. And I'll talk to you all on the next upload. Bye for now.